the priestly garments. God said that Moses would also make priestly garments for the priests. But before we, I, go, I take you to the priestly garments, I want you to know that God had an original plan. That original plan was not fulfilled, disappointing as it were. And the original plan is to be found in Exodus chapter 15 verse 5. Come with me to your Bible, Exodus chapter 15 and verse 5. And you will find there God stipulating what his plan really is, the original plan. And that this will tell you something, emphasizing something that we've been talking about too. Verse 5, now therefore, if you will indeed do what? Indeed do what? Obey my voice. Now, this word obedience, I have repeatedly brought it in connection with the altar, in connection with the temple here, that God is asking us to obey. Now he says to Israel through Moses, now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Verse 6. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. A kingdom of priests. He is not in talking to somebody in Israel. He is not talking to a family in Israel. He's not talking to a clan in Israel. He's not talking about a tribe in Israel. He's talking to the entire Israel community whom God chose. And he says, if you obey me, obey me, you will be special. Part of that speciality is this. You will be a kingdom of priests. You will be priests. And therefore, God's plan in calling Israel was that he would make them to be priests. Now, priests, to be a priest is not just a position. It's service. It's ministry. And when God appoints you, he appoints you for ministry. He appoints you for service. Israel were not chosen to live in seclusion to enjoy the warmth of salvation that Jesus provides. They were to take that but also bring it to the world as priests of the world. And as those of you who read the Bible, you know that Israel failed terribly. They did not obey the Lord as the Lord had wished. And therefore thereafter God moved to the second plan. And the second plan was, Moses, you will choose Aaron. He will be the high priest. And then you will take his sons. And they will be the priests. And later on, it also was extended to the tribe of Levites to be the priesthood of the Lord. Now let's go and see what did God do of the garments. And I have a priest here who will be coming onto stage so that you can view the garments. But come with me to Exodus chapter 29. Exodus chapter 29. And we will start reading verse 5. God is instructing Moses on how to make the garments of a priest. He says, Then you shall take the garments Put the tunic on Aaron. Uh, this was a time of consecration. Put the tunic on Aaron and the robe of the ephod, the ephod and the breastplate, and guard him with the intricately woven band of the ephod. Verse 6. You shall put the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. And you shall take the anointing oil, pour it on his head, and anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and put tunics on them. And you shall guard them with sashes, Aaron and his sons, and put the hats on them. Briefly, 
Those were the garments that Moses had been instructed to make and he made them and at the time of the consecration they dressed the priests just as God had instructed. If you go to Leviticus chapter 8 you will find the same. Let me start with the one to my to your right to my left here. This is the son of the sons of Aaron were dressed like this. They had the headpiece and the headpiece of the priest, the ordinary priest was different from the headpiece of the high priest. We didn't do it just exactly how it was. But he put on a robe we don't have here, but he has a belt, a sash around his waist. There is something that is mentioned later in the Bible. They did not put on trousers. And a God did not want them to come with nakedness in his presence. So another piece of underpant was made. It was as long as running from the west to the thighs. So the ordinary priest had four pieces. Can you name them? And even if he had put on, we would have not asked him to show it. Okay? Okay? So the ordinary priest came with that attire as God had indicated. And they did the daily services at the temple receiving the sacrifices and they are the ones who went into the first chamber to do the ministry that was required at the first chamber on behalf of the sinner who had come uh, and therefore they were ministering before the Lord. But the high priest on the other hand, he had a similar attire but in addition to it, he had a bit of more sophisticated additions. Very intricate. And I want you to know, no one in the world had a garment like this. It was intentionally made, by, instructed to be made by God. God gave the formula of how it would be made, the materials and the colors that were to be used in making these other garments. And I will tell you just exactly why did God instruct Moses to make a such. As I said, the hat, the headdress is different. It's more of a dome-like. Okay? It's more of a dome-like structure. Although made of the same sash, and that sash was, it was long and therefore it was turned around, so you will find some calling it a turbine. But those were sashes that is, were wrapped around and they made a turban or a hat. We don't have it here. But on Aaron's headdress, there was a golden plate that was placed in front here. Tied with red, I mean blue ribbons. There were a couple of ribbons, blue ribbons that were run across the head as well. But on this golden plate here, it was written, Holy to the Lord. Holy to the Lord. So we don't just talk about these garments. These garments were holy garments. Holy because designed, given by God, but also were set aside for purposes of holy things. I need to say, it's not only these garments. Anything that was connected with the temple service was holy. So you go to the market, you buy a knife for slaughtering goats, sheep, cattle. That knife is an ordinary knife like any other knife. But when it is brought onto the temple and is dedicated to the temple, at that moment it becomes holy. Don't look at it and say it looks just like any other knife. I can do with it what I want. No. It's holy. Dedicated to the Lord. It will be dealt with. 
reverently because your God is a holy God. Amen? He is a holy God. So in addition to that, there was this other blue robe. The blue color reflects, symbolizes heaven. Okay? So he had to put this on top of the robe that he had. But you will notice that this blue robe had bells. But he also had pomegranates. Pomegranate was a very expensive fruit at that time. Even today, kind of expensive fruit. But it was a very expensive thing. Um, and the bells were also tied to the... When the, when, when the high priest moved about the temple, when the bell rang, it only indicated that ministry is going on. The high priest is working and doing his work on behalf of the people in the presence of the Lord. So the bells would ring. The bells would ring. And therefore you have that red drop. But with that, after that drop, there is another thing that, another garment that he was made to wear. And that is the ephod. Now this was a multicolored, intricately woven a piece of cloth. It was one piece. One piece. It had to be one piece. And this has significance relative to the death of Jesus Christ. But it was one piece. And they made a hole for the head to go through. And then the neck was very carefully safeguarded with golden threads. So that it does not tear as God had instructed. Different colors were used. In fact, we didn't try to do it because we didn't have the money. This had also golden threads. They took gold, beat it, and cut very thin threads. It was used to prepare this multicolor piece of cloth that the high priest was made to wear. And then with that, there was also a breastplate. And that is something that is missing here we should have put. But there is a bless, breastplate. On the breastplate, you have the 12 gemstones. And the colors of those gemstones, we didn't duplicate the colors as they were. But the colors of those gemstones actually were the colors of the banners of the different tribes in Israel. And therefore, those colors were represented. The stones represent each of the tribes of Israel. Notice the position right on the chest of the high priest. This is what God says. I have brought you close to my chest. I love you. You are ever present before me. I have not abandoned you. Hallelujah. Some may say you have forgotten you. I have not. Even though you are a sinner, you are just close to my chest. I value more than the precious stones. That's what you are to me. You don't deserve to be on my knees. Not even at the back. You are at my chest. I love you. I love you. That was a signal that was sent to Israel. This particular breastplate was also, as we read the Bible, an instrument of decision making. When a decision was to be made, God would indicate by, by light on the right or by light on the left. Approval, disapproval. God actually did it. Presence was there. So when they brought their supplications, when they had their, their prayers brought through the high priest, God, the high priest represented the wishes of the people to God and the God would respond yes or no I want you to know even today we will see that this evening God does the same today even without the breastplate he is present just as he was if you choose for him to be so it was tied to a knob this knob actually should have been here at the shoulder there were two stones here black in color and on those stones, there were written 12 names of Israel. 
six on this side and the six on this other side. Twelve stones, of, I mean twelve names of Israel. Just to say that the high priest bears the guilt of the sin of Israel. Yesterday we pointed out Jesus bore your guilt. It's heavy on his shoulders. It was also indicated in the garment that he will bear the guilt. And that's why even when he had to offer sacrifice, it had to be a bull of sacrifice. And therefore the effort was tied to this stone here with golden strings. And also blue strings were tied to the effort and the reason for having these strings tied to the effort is that when, the, when he bends to, to minister, the effort should not come out or go about knocking. It was tightly held. And I love that. When you embrace the person, you want that person to really hold you tight. And God says through the, 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 the breastplate, I'm embracing you with my love. Tight holding you my love. But you know, sometimes how I behave and how we behave to our God, we want to let, we tell him, let your hands go. Let your hands go. We force ourselves out of his arm. And he says, you're not quite safe out of my arms, my child. Hang on in there. Remain with me. I love you. No one else will love you like I love you. No one else. So remain with me. You are precious. In his sight, and he had also a multicolored, made of the same material of the effort, a multicolored sash that was tied around the waist. These were the garments, and I've just quickly taken them you through them to just see how God instructed that a garment. When a priest, high priest, moved among the congregation. No one else in the known world at that time had a dress like this. I saw somebody in the U.S. who tried to make the garment exactly as God had instructed. He failed. Because you want to know the cups that held the stones were made of pure gold. Pure gold. So there is a lot of gold. The, the sides here, they were embroideries of gold pure gold in the cloth gold around the neck gold there was a lot of gold actually so he did not make he made it he tried to do everything else even the effort he did not make threads of pure gold he could not but when he finished doing that garment it cost him three thousand dollars without gold how much would it be with gold expensive, elaborate, intricate at God's instruction. And he certainly would ask the question, why did God do that? Why did he go to that extent as to ask them to make their garments like that? In Exodus chapter 28 verse 2, you find the reason there. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother. And he says, it shall be for glory and beauty. Our God is a glorious God. Our God is a God of beauty. So, continue to be beautiful, okay? You are representing God. Our God is a God of glory. Our God is a God of beauty. I wanted it the world to know that the priestly functions were intricate, were very expensive, they were delicate, they were very important far above every other vocation. And it was to be indicated by the way that God allowed for the garments to be made. Very special. Telling again the story that ministry of a high priest is very valuable, very distinct, very precious, and it is to be valued. Now, 
I put a picture of the garment. I know our slides are kind of small, but that's what I have been trying to explain to you. If you want to have another view of uh, those garments, pictorially, there you have the ordinary priest, but you have the high priest both front and back, kind of what it looked like when they were dressed up as priests. Now, Jesus is our high priest. I would like to release our priest to God. Would you thank them? Thank you very much. They are about God's business. And you hear the bell as the high priest <laughs> does his work. We will talk more about those bells as we go on along the week. But um, they are nice music, but they also had a very delicate function. Jesus Christ is our high priest. And as our high priest, he is clothed with garments of a high priest. I ask you, what does the garment of our high priest, Jesus Christ, look like? You will be mistaken to explain it in terms of clothing. You will be mistaken to explain it in, in terms of gems and stones. You will be mistaken to explain it in terms of even gold and the colored threads. The garb, the holy garb of Jesus Christ, is his glory that his garment of righteousness it has been referred to the bible as his robe now i don't have the time to take you into that to showing you into the bible what the glory actually mean but in the interest of me going into what are the garments for us today i will just say this the glory of god is his character the glory of the Lord is his character. So the high priest is clothed with what he is, a pure God in heaven, Jesus Christ. His character. Now listen to this. God had to go back. Since the original plan failed in the garden, I mean with Israelites, having chosen them and wanted each one of them to be a priest, God, after Jesus Christ died on the cross and he fulfilled the high priestly ministry, the priestly ministry, the sacrifice that he paid there on the cross, completely fulfilled by this one sacrifice forever. And those earlier sacrifices of animals did not actually atone for sins. They were symbols. They were shadows that were leading to the death of Jesus Christ. It's the death of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ that atones for the sins of the entire world. And therefore, after Jesus Christ died for you and me, a newer dispensation was begun. In that newer dispensation, God reverted back to the original plan. What was the original plan? He made a covenant with Abraham and he said, I will bless you. You will be a great nation. You will fill the earth. A covenant with its people. And that the blessing was to flow over to Israel. Israel fails by disobeying their part of the covenant. God is disappointed but has never given up with his people. Upon Jesus Christ's death on the cross, the children of Abraham still continue to be. These are children of faith. You and me. Those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. He said their Savior, their Lord. They are the spiritual children of Abraham. And the blessings that were promised about upon Abraham becomes also, they become partakers of that blessing. How do we partake of that today? First Peter chapter 2, verse 5. You also as living stones are being built upon a house, Peter writes. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Peter comes through us with declaring God's intention that those who believe in Jesus Christ after 
after his crucifixion, his resurrection, they now become the priests of God. The priesthood is not limited to Aaron, is not limited to his children, is not limited to the Levites, is not limited to Israelites. It's now, as per God's original plan, bestowed upon everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, how many of you have accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord of their lives? Praise God, I see almost every hand raised. I want you to remember this. You are priest of the Lord. Not by your campaign, by the appointment of God. You are a priest of the Holy One. My message to you today is this. Put on the garments of your priesthood. Know them, know them, but also put on your garments of your priesthood. The garments of priesthood today are not what we saw. The garments God would want you to have are the garments like what Jesus has, character, 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 character. When Jesus Christ came, he found them still putting on robes, okay? The priest sit how robe, the high priest was still dressed the way uh, God had indicated. Uh, even if there would be a few alterations here and there as you read the tradition of Israel. But he also found that the meaning of the garments had been lost. And they listen to this in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23. Jesus addresses the Pharisees the leaders of the temple when he came to die for the world. And this is, is what he says. Oh, sorry, uh, that is, I didn't read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Again, emphasizing the same point that God has chosen you. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. What makes you holy? How many of you are holy? You are not priests then. Listen, you are holy. Somebody say amen. amen. You are holy. I know you look onto your filthy garments and you say, how can I be holy? You are holy unto the Lord. There are two ways you are holy. One way. You remember the knife? It's bought in the marketplace. That same knife with the same material brought and dedicated for the temple, it becomes what? Holy. Same knife. Nothing altered. Nothing changed. Same material. Did not come down from heaven. Made by the blacksmith of the time. But when it was set apart for holy things, it became holy even though it looked ragged. Hallelujah. It did. Literally did. Now God says, I have chosen you. When God chooses you, he has set you apart. What did he say? For spiritual services. You are holy. You are holy. It, it troubles me as a minister of the gospel knowing this truth. You're, the, you're not the first ones. I go asking in the churches, how many of you are holy? Just as it was here, no hand goes up. How can you be holy and not know it? What do you want the Lord to do to you? Have you not accepted Jesus as Lord and your Savior of your life? What is it that you are missing from the Lord to accept? His appointment. You are very, very special to him. He says, you did not choose me. I chose you. When God chose Israel, it's not because they were perfect. They were sinners, and you can see it. They gave God trouble. They God gave her trouble. God does not choose you because you're perfect. And only God can do that. He does not 
choose you because you while you were yet sinners I chose you you are mine you're mine but he says once you have accepted me as a sinner I am your Lord I get doing something first of all by choosing you you are mine everything that belongs to God is holy holy and if you believe you belong to God you had better believe that you are holy the problem is this and listen to me very carefully if you don't know you don't believe you're not aware you have not acknowledged your holiness as part being set apart it will be very difficult to live a holy life how can you live what you don't know you cannot God has made you holy by setting you apart that's why you will see a human being like me standing here to preach any one of you any one of you can have access to this as long as you believe in Jesus Christ you have accepted him as Lord and Savior that's why you would see anyone coming up here and preaching the message ministering not only here in the temple of God in your home at your house even in your workplace the marketplace where you are you are ministering for the Lord and as a as a priest you don't have to be reminded of your priestly responsibilities a priest who knows that he or she is a priest will be about will put on bells will be about doing the ministry of the priest they will do their work and let me tell you this if you don't know that you are holy priest how can you minister how will you ever feel like ministering you will think you are an ordinary person remember in first peter chapter 2 verse 9 he says you are a peculiar people now we met this yesterday what was peculiar yesterday what was unique yesterday if you remember something we talked about that was unique thank you very much the bread what was unique about the bread it was made without yeast and living bread you are unique you are peculiar God has chosen you to be unique and your uniqueness is to be found or to be exhibited in the ministry that you will do on behalf, the spiritual ministry you do on behalf of Jesus Christ to the people in your home to the people in your office to the people in your sphere of influence and even beyond God has made us to be priests in Revelation chapter 1 if we go there in Revelation chapter 1 you will find this thought repeated again God reverts back to his original plan chapter 1 verse 4 and go on to 6 John in the greeting he says John to the seven churches which are in Asia grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne verse 5 and from Jesus Christ the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood the six and he has made us kings and what and priests he has made us kings and the priests to his kingdom and the father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever and what do you say amen. amen it's a man that god found me worthy to be a priest i know i am not worthy there is nothing that i bring for my god to appoint me into that higher spiritual office to be a priest for him 
but he has done it. He has elevated me. You can understand when he says, I have you right up my chest like a breastplate. You mean a lot to me. You may even undervalue yourself. Because, listen to this, God does not view you because of what you look like now. He views you as to what he can make you to be. The potential in you. When he says, I have called you with the everlasting love, I have set you apart. There is another side of holiness that he will work. Me and you will wake you, will, will, will work with you to shape you now into holiness. So it will not be just holiness by separation, but it will also be holiness by being. The process of holiness by being is a progressive process. And that's why I told you yesterday, God's word. God's word is a way through the power of the Holy Spirit. God works to lead you into holiness. To transform you into holiness. That process of holiness will not be complete until when he comes and uh, Paul says, we shall be changed. This immortal body will bear on immortality. In this twinkling of an eye, this body will be transformed for eternity again. It will bear the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It will be glorified. Now, let me run quickly through this. In a thousand years, by the way, even during the thousand years after we are taken to heaven, we will also be priests of God and of Jesus Christ. What an honor to minister in the presence, the physical presence of God. What an honor. What does God need to do to show that we are special? What does God need to do to show that he has really loved us? Everlasting love is a love that will never let go. It will never let go. What are the garments? This is what I wanted to run to. Matthew chapter 23, and probably you still have your finger there. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23, you will find the words Jesus that are directed to the Pharisees. This is a straight message that is given to the Pharisees because of what Jesus found them. Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law. What are those more important matters of the law of God? Justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. What is Jesus saying to these people? These are people who, even though they should put on the garbs of priesthood, the inside was rotten. They took pride of the garments, the outside garments which had glory. They would show of the outside acts and behaviors that existed outside, which were false front because they did not come from inside. And the God, Jesus Christ, delivers a very direct message. Hypocrites. They would pride themselves, I give tithe. Now let me ask you, how do you feel when you give tithe faithfully to God? It feels good, doesn't it? When you bring your offering, what does it do? It makes you feel good. There is something beyond, behind that that you need to also assess. What is the motive of your feeling good? What actually sparks that? Are you, are you happy that I have done something good and therefore I deserve a reward from God? I have pleased my God and therefore I qualify to be saved, to be forgiven my sins, and therefore I go, I feel good. They would stand by the open places. And pray. You remember the example Jesus gave. I'm not like that poor beggar. I pray. I give tithe. I evangelize. I do everything. And the other ones, their poor man would say, 
mm, wicked man like me. He gives offerings, never says it. He prays. It's not something to be brought in the public. It's a matter of the heart. A relationship from the heart with the Lord. What I hear God, Jesus says, saying is that giving tithe, offering, preaching, and these outward acts are essential. They are okay. But you also have to examine what motivates, what are they a product of. If they are but a cover to hide the rotten inside, there was nothing. Those are not the garments, Jesus says, that my priests will put on. My priests will put on the inner garments. What are those garments? With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old in Micah chapter 6 verse 7? 6. You're going to verse 7. Will the Lord be blessed with thousands of rams? 10,000 rivers of oil. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Verse 8. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord your God require of you? To do justly, justice. To, to love mercy, to be merciful. To walk humbly with your God. These are the requirements that God has upon you. I know he has said, bring ye tithe. I know he has said, pray unto me. I know he has said, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he says, the primary demands that I have upon my priests are the inner qualities, the inner garments. Those inner qualities which when actually dressed, they will make even the outside qualities meaningful. Acts. They will be, you remember God at one time would say, these are your offerings. The same God who said you bring a lamb and sacrifice, bring grain offering. At one time he turns to Israel and he says, I have no pleasure, no pleasure whatsoever in your offerings. Because they brought an offering as an outward act. Their heart was so far from God. They did not allow the act of sacrifice that was meant actually to be a very thoughtful thing. Where you think of what you did and an innocent one has to die. And you burn with pain and anguish from inside. You, you, you say, why did I do what I did? You repent genuinely, not outwardly as an act of showing. But a true repentance that is from inside. They missed out on that. And the God would say, even if it was a thousand kilometers of oil that you brought for the candlestick. Even if it's those rams and cows and whatever you brought as offering, unless they are accompanied with what goes inside you, they are meaningless. You are priests of the Lord. I plead with you, consider dressing with the garments of Jesus Christ. I long to have those garments. Please do anything possible to rechange my heart, to make my heart to be willing to be transformed from within, that I may bear not those outward qualities, but the inner qualities. You know, as human beings, we have a problem. We cannot read so much about what is inside. We are so good at reading at what is outside. But Jesus said, don't do what? Don't judge. Why do you think he said that? You're limited. You don't know what has issued from inside to come outside. We can talk to a brother to correct whatever they have to correct, but we can never judge. We are never allowed to judge. The judgment belongs to who? But many a times we pass judgments. He's bad. Bad on the chest of Jesus Christ? Leave it to God. Leave it to God. Sometimes we'll deal very harshly with one another. 
develop the inequalities. The inequalities don't have cruelty. The inequalities don't have harshness. The inequalities, when you bundle them together, they bring a character, a bundle of a person unique in our world today. And Jesus would say, put on the priestly garments. Be my priest. I have appointed you. Become one by seeking the more valuable things without ignoring those outer acts, which are also very, very important and significant. Politeness, God says a lot about that. Obedience, someone would write and say, has the, has, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? He says, to obey is what? Is better than sacrifice. Inequalities are always far better than the outer qualities. The outer qualities gain their value if they issue forth from the inequalities. First Corinthians chapter 13, you know this very well, some of you. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass and a clinging symbol, nothing. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand the mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, ah, young, nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not proud of itself. It is, it is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. It is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Bears all things. Believes in all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. Verse 13. And now abides faith, hope, love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. Love is an inner quality. If somebody loves you hypocritically, it doesn't take time, you will know it. And you will be mad. Purports to love me when he or she actually does not love me. It's very annoying. Very, very annoying. Now, to come in the presence of God, if it cannot be annoying to us human beings, how do you minister before the Lord with hypocrisy and accept, expect that God would not be disturbed by that? God appeals to me, Geoffrey, put on the inner garments. My, I have extended my love in my part of the covenant. I have even appointed you to be my priest. My part I have done faithfully. Will you also do your part? Accept me to come into your life. I have made you holy by appointment, but I also want to transition you into true holiness of a changed life as we work together. Are you willing to let me do just that? Because I have come down out the altar to do that. And this is the message I had to give to you from the altar today. God and man meet at the altar. And when they meet at the altar, man does what he wants to God. But also God does what he wants to man. And one of the things that God does at the altar is to recreate his own. We were mad, completely mad when sin came. The image of God was lost. The glory of God was gone. We are not as God had originally created us. God desires us so honestly to bring us back to restore us to the original original plan where we are truly partakers of the image of, of God his character but he begins now by appointing you to be his priest and as he appoints you to be priest he is by that expressing a desire that I will work with you to bring the inner qualities that actually make a true priest. 
Are you willing to let the Lord do that in your life? Would you examine yourself very carefully in your heart because you are capable of doing that? And say, Lord, first of all, I want to thank you for appointing me as a priest. I don't qualify. But since you have extended your love beyond my comprehension, I also realize that I, I am not a finished product. I am on the treadmill. You are in the business of recreating me. Sometimes when you recreate me, I stop your hands. I pull myself back. But the Lord says, no, I have come at the altar to recreate you, to make you new, to come back to what I intended you to be originally. I mean it. I'm here for you. Not just to talk, but to change you. Put on love. God says, I have a vineyard in chapter 5 of Isaiah. I have a vineyard. And on that vineyard, I prepared the farm pretty well. And then I went and chose the choicest of the seedlings of the vineyard. And then I planted those. And as a good farmer, I did everything possible to make sure that the vineyard, the vines grow superbly. So I am a good farmer, God says. I invested everything necessary, including security, so that my vines may bear fruit. And when I was done with the good work, to my own satisfaction, I sat and waited for the vine to bring out good, sweet grapes. And God complains, behold, I'm getting sour grapes. The inequalities. What are they? What, when God opens my heart, what does he see in me? What garments does he see me dressed up in? Does he still see a priest for the modern time? Or would my Jesus come pointing at me, Geoffrey, war unto you? I appointed you to be my minister, to be my priest, but you don't seem willing to live up to it. God is appealing to you today. I know the Holy Spirit has been speaking in your heart even as I speak here. The Holy Spirit has, has been working with you. Those of you who have been attending this week, the message from the sanctuary is a powerful message. We cannot get to the depth of it all. I'm starting you off. If you haven't started learning the subject of the sanctuary, let these two weeks start you off. There are deeper gems that are to be drawn from the message of the sanctuary. But the appeal that God has for you this morning is that you will be willing to bear those qualities that I want you to have. Create in me a clean heart, O oh Lord, was the prayer that David had. Do I see anyone this morning touched pray the prayer of David sincerely from your heart? Lord, I know my heart. You're not done with me. I pray that you will create a clean heart in me. I pray that you will transform me from inside out. I want to be a true priest of yours. This morning I want to offer a special prayer, very special prayer to you, because you're choosing to be that priest that God wants to be. And if that's your choice, you're saying to God, I thank you, first of all, for the privilege you have extended to me to be a priest. I can't even imagine. I can't fathom it. But I thank you for the privilege. But I also pray that you will help me to live the priestly life, to put on the garments. If this is the desire of your heart, I request you to stand wherever you are. May God bless you as you commit yourself. This is what God said to Jeremiah. Go down to the potter's house. And there you will find in Jeremiah chapter 18, there you will find the potter working on a pot. 
But as he's doing his work on the pot, something will go wrong with the pot. And as Jeremiah walks down, he sees exactly what God had told him. I mean, he goes there, he sees what? The potter. And when he was looking, uh, the potter was working on wheels on the pot, but the pot became mad in his hands. Then Jeremiah saw something very unique. The potter did not decide to take that pot and throw it away. Instead, it's like the potter took that mad pot and put it on his chest in the language of the breastplate. Instead of throwing it away, he put it on his chest, a mad pot. And then his, Jeremiah, as he was watching, he saw the potter make a decision that I will make another pot as I see fit, not as the pot sees fit. The, your potter sees. You are the potter. I mean, you are the clay. You are the clay. And as a clay, the message in Jeremiah is this. You are a mad clay in God's hand. Some people will say, look at you and say, mm, God has part you. God has thrown you. Tell them that's not the message from my God. My God still has me in the palm of his hands. Amen. I may be wicked. I may not be as righteous. I may be still very short. But I am in the palm of my creator God. Hallelujah. God had come to lift Israel out of Egypt. So he said, when you make bread, when it's time of salvation, there's no time to waste. Act quickly. And therefore, you will not make the ordinary bread of yeast, which takes time. It will be unleavened. I want you to obey the call of salvation now. Don't procrastinate don't procrastinate 